Uh, hey, I'm here with Jeffrey O'Hallam, the writer of Child of Light, a, a new downloadable, is that correct? Yeah, it's a digital title. Yeah, the very, very visually beautiful, as you're probably seeing right now, uh, role-playing game that is, that is coming out later this month. Um, this is a pretty big departure from the last game you, you wrote, Far Cry 3. Uh, talk about that shift, I guess, and like moving from a game that is a st like pretty brutal to something that is really beautiful and sort of almost childlike. Well, for me, Far Cry 3 was uh, kind of punk in yeah. that it was about tearing down a lot of the um, things we've come to expect in video games mm -hmm. and kind of asking you to look at them in a mirror and say, what do you think of this picture? Yeah. You know, it was, it was, a, it was a destructive uh, narrative. And uh, Child of Light is the opposite. It's a, a creative, hopeful piece trying to build a future. You know, one that explores this vast in between space between AAA blockbusters and uh, indie intellectual titles. You know that there's this, this space that's populated in the film industry by movies like E.T. Mm. or Juno, and as an industry and an art form, video games have really not waded into that space at all. And I think it's uh, exciting and essential to, to try to scope that out because um, I believe that games are a mainstream art form. That's cool, and it's funny that you mention uh, Far Cry 3's sort of subversive punk aesthetic, because uh, the reaction to that game seemed interesting in that a lot of people maybe didn't notice or like pick up on some of your intent in that. And I'm curious, like as a as a creator and as a writer, what what sort of lessons you took from that experience that informed how you wrote this game? Um, just that if you're going to attack an audience, <laughs> you don't make something for that audience. Yeah. And so I, uh, I realized that the people, I think, who would have uh, enjoyed to its fullest the, the subterranean aspects of Far Cry 3, mm -hmm. which, by the way, were always intended as subterranean aspects, and mm. there's a lot of things that haven't even been mined there um, that have been added for people to find beneath the surface. Mm. But all of that was supposed to be subterranean, and the overall experience was... Um, I think enjoyed by a lot of people um, and uh, generally by a lot of critics too. Mm -hmm. So uh, that part of the experience I'm happy with. For sure. um, and I'm happy with the other stuff too. I mean it really was intended for uh, people who wanted more depth mm -hmm. and wanted to explore, uh, kind of flip things around in a different perspective. But if you make something for that audience, um, a lot of them I don't think actually bought Far Cry 3. Mm -hmm. That's and so uh, it was almost a game that's intended for an audience that didn't play it. Mm. And the audience that did play it, I think, got a lot of enjoyment out of it. So uh, in this case, with Child of Light, I'm not attacking. You know, it's not meant as a look at this thing that you have. Are you happy with it? Mm -hmm. Instead, it's um, let's see where we can go. Gotcha. And, and so I think, I think what I learned to uh, summarize what you're asking, yeah. is that um, destructive energy should be backed up with a new vision. Mm. And so Child of Light is that new vision. Sweet. Um, and it's, it is visually, like I, I don't know that I've ever seen a game that looks exactly like this. I think the easiest comparison for, for some reason is, or for obvious reasons, is, is maybe Rayman because it's an UbiArt game. Um, but one thing that stands out to me about this game is that it's got this like really gorgeous parallax 2D art style and then the protagonist and a lot of the human characters are polygonal. And I'm, I'm really interested in sort of the decision to, to go that route with it, whereas like the conversations are 2D and then the character model is 3D. Um, well, the UB art engine, mm -hmm. which we adapted from Rayman Origins, um, the characters in that engine were modeled in 3D. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the way that the engine works, we would have to completely redesign the engine in order to have a 2D character. But what we did ultimately, I think, ended up working um, both for the aesthetic and for uh, you know, our ability to alter the engine. We, made, we, took, a th we took 3D characters and um, modeled them in such a way that they appear 2D. Mm -hmm. And so what that allows is you know, when you fly Aurora and you're turning, you can see uh, her from all of these wonderful angles that you wouldn't be able to see if she were truly 2D. And the way that she animates is fluid and beautiful. And so um, 
I think that we took advantage of that. Cool. Um, I think something that is really immediately apparent when you look at this game is that it comes from a JRPG uh, background, I think, or at least there was heavy JRPG influence. Uh, are there any sort of specific games that you feel like you pulled from most directly when, when sort of building your idea of what Child of Light would be? Uh, the creative director, Patrick Plord, was very much inspired by uh, Grandia 2. Mm. There's a uh, cast bar at the bottom, which became the timeline in Child of Light, yeah. and, and then also Final Fantasy VI. You know, this, uh, this uh, concept when you um, approach an enemy, you enter a battle arena, and everyone is kind of stacked and, and fighting against each other. That uh, feeling uh, allowed for an intelligent battle that isn't Twitch-based, which relates much more to the plot of the game, because this is about a, a young girl facing obstacles to grow up. And so it's not about, you know, in our everyday, everyday life, and in most people's lives, it's not Twitch-based combat. <laughs> you know, right. but it is that you have obstacles in your path that you have to strategically figure out how to eliminate. And so the metaphor uh, works much better. And also, you're not flooded with adrenaline when you play this game, you know. Um, when Pat approached me, he had a soundtrack created with tracks from Amelie mm -hmm. and uh, Final Fantasy. And he said, this is the mood I want to make. And then he had some paintings by John Bauer and other early 20th century fairy tale artists. And he said, this is the kind of look. And, and then he had you know, a, a, a young girl named Aurora who could fly. And then from there, I was inspired by um, stories that I read growing up that have really uh, been a touchstone for me, like Thaw's books, um, The Black Cauldron, um, The Grey King, A Wrinkle in Time, mm -hmm. these stories of children from our world that stumble upon gateways to other worlds, and that uh, magical moment where the everyday retreats into the fantastical. And so, um, at that moment, you know, I took Aurora and I made her into a girl from 1895 Austria, and um, she wakes up in this strange place and is, at first thinks it's a dream, and then gradually begins to uncover what's really going on. Cool. Yeah, I, I'm really excited to see more about the the realistic setting and sort of how that plays into uh, the narrative. So this is coming out later this month, right? April. April 30th. April yeah. 30th. Cool. And uh, to ask you the two boring questions: How much does it cost, and about how long is it? Um, it costs 14.99. Mm -hmm. And it's like 15 plus hours, 10 to 15, and you could probably even go over that. Um, it's a big game. And uh, in terms of the script, for example, it's a 200 page script written entirely in rhyme. <laughs> and it's longer than Far Cry 3, the script. Wow. That's crazy. Well, thank you so much for talking to me, man. It was uh, really, really interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing more from it.